Dear, dear friends, uh, good evening. Uh, welcome to the third episode of uh, Diabetes Crossroads uh, Practice Changing uh, Update Series. Uh, now, this uh, uh, this month, we have a eminent speaker and a senior diabetologist, uh, Dr. Anita Nambiar, to address us on comprehensive medical evaluation of the patients with diabetes. We also have a panel discussion comprising um, of uh, panelists, Dr. Uh, Ajit Kumar, Dr. Dipu, and Dr. Asha Ashik. All are uh, well-known physicians all around uh, dealing with diabetes. Uh, anyway, I uh, thank you all for uh, being here in time. Today, uh, in the absence of uh, Dr. Chantri Madam, we have to probably proceed without the uh, presence of the chair here because she is at uh, Bangalore, at, let go, gone for an examination as an examiner. So I hand over the mic to uh, Prashant Shankar uh, for the proceedings further. Uh, please, uh, Prashant, take over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Suryar sir, and uh, uh, Rom, good evening to all to this uh, third episode of uh, Diabetes Crossroads, which has been uh, running in a very good way uh, for the last uh, couple of months. And uh, we are into the third episode now. Today, uh, we will be discussing on uh, a different aspect of diabetes. Every month, we will be discussing on uh, different aspects of diabetes from the basics so that uh, we, uh, get, we are brushed up on uh, the basics of uh, diabetes. And uh, uh, we are in touch with the latest happenings uh, in the field of diabetes. So the topic today is ensuring a smooth journey and a comprehensive assessment of patient with diabetes. So uh, when a patient with diabetes comes to you for the first time, it's a first visit, whether it's a newly diagnosed patient with diabetes or a patient who is coming to you for the first time, first visit, what are the things we, we are supposed to do? Uh, how to uh, evaluate that patient comprehensively, how, what are the comorbidities to be assessed in this patient, how frequently we should follow up. All these things are very important because uh, as the title says, we have to ensure a smooth journey for people with diabetes. It's, it's not always a smooth journey which people are facing. Every now and then we see patients with diabetes coming up with complications, somebody coming up with an amputation, somebody coming with a high creatinine level, or somebody coming to us uh, for a concern for a uh, intravitreal injection, or somebody coming up, uh, coming uh, with a stent inside, or uh, uh, coming with a bypass surgery. So a large number of these complications are preventable if you uh, evaluate the patient properly and ensure a smooth journey by uh, proper follow-up of the patient. So that's what is aimed, or that's what we are aiming by uh, presenting this topic. Uh, this uh, session we have planned into two, diff two uh, uh, sections. The first section uh, will be a lecture on uh, the comprehensive assessment uh, based on the, the standard international guidelines, uh, which will be dealt with by Dr. Anita Nambiar. Uh, Dr. Anita Nambiar doesn't need any introduction to this audience. Uh, she is a very experienced uh, physician uh, from Kochi, and she is currently uh, working as the senior consultant uh, physician in BPS Lakeshore Hospital. She has got uh, decades of experience in the management of patients with diabetes. She has had uh, leading uh, positions in all the uh, important uh, organizations with respect to diabetes and internal medicine. And uh, probably she is uh, a right person to talk, give a lecture on this. After that, we will have a separate panel discussion, expert panel discussion, followed by uh, interactive session on uh, the comorbidities of diabetes. Here again, the comorbidities as ADA defines, it's not the, the hypertension or uh, dyslipidemia, which are uh, risk factors for diabetes or the, the coronary artery disease, which are complications. Comorbidities is defined by ADA as uh, illnesses which occur in patients with diabetes more commonly than the general population. So, uh, and these many of these illnesses are not taken care of very frequently or we neglect uh, these illnesses thinking that uh, uh, patients with diabetes, diabetes may not be affected. So there are a specific set of illnesses which are recommended by uh, uh, the, the American Diabetes Association, which we should uh, consider in uh, uh, all patients coming with diabetes and uh, some patients uh, who are at risk of those particular diseases will require screening uh, for such illnesses and proper follow-up for such comorbidity. So the second part of the discussion will be on that. So uh, uh, without wasting much of time, I would uh, uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Anita Anampia to uh, uh, start off the session with uh, 
the comprehensive medical evaluation of patients with diabetes. I will be introducing the panelists at the end of the uh, first session. Am I audible? Yes, madam, very much. Okay, so a very good evening to all of you. Uh, it's a privilege and honor to be uh, a part of uh, this uh, diabetic uh, uh, crossroads uh, episode three. Uh, I thank all the governing council members of RSSDIQLA chapter and uh, my special thanks to Dr. Suresh from Calicut, who is our secretary and Prashant, the coordinator. And thank you Prashant for the kind words of interaction. And uh, so in next 20 minutes or so, I would be talking on the comprehensive medical evaluation of patients with diabetes. Uh, so uh, my talk will be under four sections. Uh, 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 these are the contents of my talk, uh, a brief introduction to the subject, aims of assessing, uh, types of assessment, what are the components of assessment, complication and comorbidities and patient-centered approach. So uh, what I'm going to talk is nothing new, but it's just a recapitulation of what we have studied in the past or what we have learned in the past. So um, first is the introduction to the subjects, uh, why we need to treat diabetes. So the simple answer to this question is that we want to prevent and delay complications and we have to optimize a quality, good quality of life. So that's the main reason why we treat patients. And um, uh, just before that, let me tell you a few things uh, that um, when we treat a uh, diabetic patient, it is not only uh, the uh, diabetic part that is taken care of, but we have to see all the other things like the complication which has occurred in that patient because of diabetes, whether it is a cardiovascular or retinopathy or neuropathy or nephropathy and all the comorbid condition that is associated with the patient. Pa diabetic patient see us uh, three, uh, for three reasons. One is uh, diabetic per se, Second, uh, the diabetic patient comes to us with complication. And the third thing is diabetic patient may come to us with unrelated problems. So each opportunity, each visit is an opportunity to talk to the patient, to analyze and assess him in a good way. And every time we see him, we have to reinforce two things. One is lifestyle modification and the psychosocial care. So these are the three uh, the th uh, three th uh, things that we need to take into consideration when we talk about uh, diabetic assessment. And one more important thing that I would like to tell is that when we assess a patient, we have to, th uh, we have to keep many things, uh, uh, we have to see for many things. Firstly, whether the patient, uh, how old the patient is. Second, the, is the patient school going? Or what is the time that he can spend for physical activities? Is he having any drug abuse? Is he literate? Can he read uh, numericals? Because some patients with uh, insulin, they have to read uh, the numericals, whether he's able to, how is his sleep pattern? How is his economic status? All these things to be taken into consideration when we assess a patient. And this whole thing that I'm going to talk in next few minutes is taken from the Standard of Medical Care in Diabetes 2022. And it will be more specific to type two diabetic patients because we see more of type two diabetic patients. And at times I will be just touching or brushing few investigations that are required for type one diabetic patients. So once we uh, do all the assessment, we have to see uh, for the ongoing care. This care actually is uh, uh, ongoing care. And uh, in between, we have to review the patient, whether the treatment that we are giving to the patient is correct, whether the goals we have set is uh, uh, it's achievable or not. So what are the aims of assessing the patient? Uh, it is the most important is to educate the patient and enable them to monitor and manage their diabetes, to assess any problem in the glycemic control and address them, if there is any complication, we have to treat them, educate and reinforce healthy lifestyle advices to assess the patient's overall health and to treat any associated or coincidental illness, physical or mental, and to provide support and advice to the patient on how to cope up with the living in a chronic illness and uh, to alter their lifestyle to maintain a health. 
So the important thing is we have to, the education, diabetic care system, diabetes education is very, very important when we assess the patient and we train the patient because that is the most important thing. And the uh, use of language is also very important when we talk to the patient because um, the good language can actually can have an impact on their behavior and uh, in their behavior. So if we talk to the patient in a nice way, they will be um, getting the correct essence of what we want to say. But if we have got something, if you talk to them in a rude way, they may not be. And this uh, ass assessment and treating a uh, diabetic patient is actually a multidisciplinary uh, process. So we have to take into consideration all these aspects, which I will be talking. So coming to the important talk that is comprehensive medical evaluation. So we need to confirm the diagnosis and classify diabetes. I think this uh, aspect will be taken in the near future, uh, uh, in the near future episodes. And we have to evaluate the diabetic complication and potential comorbid condition, review previous treatment and risk factors controlled in patients with established diabetes, begin patients engagement in the formulation of a care management plan and develop a plan for continuing care. Also, a follow-up visit should include most components of the initial comprehensive medical evaluation. Ongoing management should be guided by assessment of overall health status, diabetic complication, cardiovascular risk, hypoglycemia, and shared decision-making to set therapeutic goals. Now, uh, coming to uh, the comprehensive diabetic medical evaluation. So we have uh, three types of uh, uh, visits. One is the initial visit, as Dr. Prashant has said, for when he's coming for the first time, or he has already been seen by some other doctors. Again, he's coming to us for the first time. So that is the initial visit. Then we have a follow-up visit that can occur every three months or six months. And then the annual visit that occurs once in a year. And almost all the components of the initial visit is uh, uh, taken care. And the same things are repeated in the annual visit as well. But there are a few things that we do not repeat when they come for a follow-up visit. So uh, the five components of uh, this uh, comprehensive diabetic medical evaluation, firstly, it is uh, past medical and family history. Then we have a behavioral uh, concept then what we have is a medical medication and vaccination schedule, then the technology use and the social platform. These are the headings under which we do the comprehensive uh, diabetic medical evaluation. So coming to the diabetic history, we should know the characteristic at onset, at what age did it start? What were the symptoms, whether he had polyphagia, polydipsia, polyuria, there was tiredness, there was visual disturbances, whether there was weight loss, our patient had difficulty in walking and whether had he had any skin infection, especially infection of the genitalia itching in that part, all these need to be taken care of or evaluated. And the rest is the review of previous treatment regime and response. That includes what were the drugs he was taking, whether he was on OHA or insulin, and how he was taking the drug, whether he was regular in taking, whether there was any intolerance or there was any in allergy to the drugs. That is the second. And then we have to ask, uh, assess the frequency, cause, severity of past hospitalization. So whether he had hypoglycemic attacks in between, whether he was at, uh, admitted for diabetic ketoacidosis or hyperosmolar uh, hyperglycemic state, whether he had undergone that state, and whether he had an angina was admitted for any cerebrovascular cardiac problem, or retinopathy, neuropathy, or any problem for which he needed hospitalization. The second aspect is family history. It's very important. So family history of diabetes in the parents and in first degree relatives, siblings, and family history of autoimmune disorder is very important, especially in type uh, 1 diabetic, where they have got uh, autoimmune thyroiditis and thyroid other related autoimmune disorders. Coming to the personal history and complication and common common comorbidities. I think this will be taken in the panel discussion. So we have to see the common comorbidities like uh, cancers, obesity, 
sleep apnea and uh, non-alcoholic fat, fatty liver disease. We had to uh, see for that and we have to ask for the history, whether the patient had hypertension, abnormal lipids, whether there was um, any microvascular and macrovascular complication, which would be in the form of uh, puffiness of face or edema in the food, breathlessness and exertion, all those signs and sim um, uh, uh, symptoms of micro and microvascular complication, whether the patient had uh, uh, had uh, hypoglycemia, whether he's aware of what are these hypoglycemic uh, features, and whether he's getting it frequently, what are the causes, is there any timing, especially for these episodes, presence of any hemoglobinopathies or anemias, when he had the last dental visit and whether his eyes were examined by an ophthalmologist. Then we have an interval history, that is uh, uh, when we change the medicine or there's some, something must have happened in the family. So that thing also we can assess during this. Now coming to behavioral factors. And that includes eating patterns and uh, weight history, how, how many times he eats, what is his caloric intake, all those can be assessed. And uh, uh, assess familiarity with carbohydrate counting, especially in that type one diabetic patients and type two diabetic uh, treated with MDI. Uh, let me tell you that this all has been taken with uh, taken from standard of medical care from diabetes 2022 ADA guidelines. Um, uh, this uh, usually in our setting, we do not ask all these questions, but those people who are having a good diabetic clinic, they, they do all this carbohydrate counting. And uh, physical activity and sleep behavior. Sleep is a very important aspect in diabetic patients. Seven hours of sleep is important. It is said that less sleep, poor sleep, and increased sleep, they increase HbA1c. Whether he has got any substance abuse, tobacco, alcohol. And then we come to medication and vaccination. What are the medication uh, regime, what he is taking? Uh, whether uh, medication taking, how is your medication taking behavior? Because with many of the patients, they may take insulin one day and they will not take the insulin other I means uh, on the uh, next day, they will take OHA. So there are some behavioral problems with the diabetic patient because of the chronic illness. And whether he has or the patient has got any medical in, uh, medication intolerance or side effect, and whether apart from what the drugs have been prescribed by the doctor, whether he is taking any alternative medicine like homeopathy, Ayurveda, Siddha medicine, and taking medicine from uh, directly from the shop, all this needs to be assessed and vaccination history and needs. So vaccination plays an important role uh, that I will talk uh, in my subsequent slides, but the main thing will be taken in the panel discussion and the technology use. Um, it is coming in big way and we have to assess the use of health application, online education, patient portal, whether patient is able to do um, self-monitoring or blood glucose level, whether all the results are with the him, the, whether he uses the data for anything else, as if he's, if he's showing this to the doctor who is treating him. And if the patient is on uh, insulin pump, review insulin pump setting and use, and uh, as the same procedure which I think which I've said for glucose monitoring. Now, the lastly, the social life assessment. Social life, we have to uh, identify a social support because many of the people may not be having good um, financially, they may not be sound. So they have the social support to, and also to identify surrogate decision makers because few of the patients who are not able to take decision of theirs. Other people, they take the decision and that is called surrogate decision makers and also the help of the advanced care, means people who take care of them, uh, such people. Identify social determinants in health, what is about is food security, housing stability, homelessness, transportation access, financial security, community uh, safety, et cetera. Now, physical examination, which is backbone of uh, diabetic comprehensive analysis, height, weight, BMI, waist, and hip circumference waist hip ratio is important in children as well as adolescent we have to uh, check the blood pressure if there's any history of or the some drugs which you are taking which can cause orthostatic uh, change in blood pressure pressure should be uh, taken in sitting standing position lying down position and uh, fundoscopic examination previously i used to do myself now uh, we refer to the eye specialist which has to be seen in a dilated uh, I 
and thyroid palpation specifically for, for type 1 diabetic patient but we know that in kerala especially and also all over the all over the world majority of patients with diabetic uh, has got thyroid dysfunction as well skin examination is important with acanthosis nigricans if there are marks of acanthosis nigricans and we should uh, look for the injection site of insulin to see whether there is anything like the lipodystrophy. And then we have to comprehensive foot examination, which is very, very important, and it should not be neglected at any cost. This is one which should be done in all the visits, and that is very important. We have to see, we have to have a, a look at visual inspection to be done to see how the skin is whether it is dry, moist, the integrity of the skin, whether there is any callus formation, foot deformity or ulcers or to nail, nails to be seen. And we have to palpate the peripheral pulsation, especially the dorsalis pedis and posterior tibial to see the pulsation. If there is any uh, evidence of peripheral arterial disease, uh, we have to do an ABI. Uh, and then we have to determine the temperature how the temperature of the lower limb vibration or pinprick sensation, we have to see for touch with 10 gram monofilament examination. If we are not convinced, then we can subject them for uh, biothesiometer. Um, and then screen for depression, anxiety and disordered eating and consider assessment for functional performance. Now that laboratory evaluation, uh, see this again and again, I'm telling that these are taken from the ADA guidelines. We are the providers and we have to look what is the most important test to be done on patient. Our patient may not be very rich. So we have to use every means, uh, we have to judicially think which test to be done to which patient at what point of time. So this is up to the discretion of the provider, healthcare providers, what tests are needed at that particular time. So if the patient has done HbA1c in last three months, it will not be repeated. If not, HbA1c, a fasting blood sugar and a postprandial blood sugar. Also lipid profile, specifically the total cholesterol, triglycerides, LDL and HDL, liver function test, it can be altered with many drugs as well, so need to be seen. We have to see for blood urea and creatinine, spot urinary albumin to creatinine ratio to see macroalbuminuria, which will point out for endothelial dysfunctions. And thyroid stimulating hormone in type 1 as well as type 2 patients. Uh, vitamin B12, again a question mark, it will be done or not. Um, but patients on long-term metformin, it can be estimated. Serum potassium levels in patients who are on ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and diuretics, and not to forget about ECGs, and in, if required, echo as well as um, echo as well. Now, this I have finished all about uh, the physical examination history. Now we have to um, assess. Uh, um, we have to do the assessment as to as. Um, uh, to find out what treatment plan should be given to such patients. For that, we have to do uh, assessing risk for diabetic complication, which includes atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, uh, risk assessment, whether the patient has got any history of heart failure or cardiac problem, staging of chronic renal disease, and hypoglycemia risk, assessment for retinopathy, and assessment for neuropathy. All these to be assessed. As I said earlier, that many disciplines are uh, uh, there when we talk about managing diabetes, which I will be talking a bit later. Now we have to set a goal. So after assessing everything, we have to set a goal that what should be his HbA1c level, A1c level, what should be his fasting and post and uh, what should be the time in range target. And if the patient is hypertensive, we have to always uh, put a target for his blood pressure levels and also uh, diabetic self-management goal. Coming to therapeutic treatment plans, uh, the most important, again, again, we say that it is lifestyle management and um, we have to use pharmacological agents to reduce the glucose therapy. Uh, of glucose lowering agents. And then if the patient has cardiovascular renal disease risk factors, we have to use drugs which are suitable uh, for that uh, complications of diabetes. We have to tell them how to use glucometers and how to uh, be, I mean, use the insulin delivery devices. We have to, um, re, uh, every we have to tell them in detail and we have to refer this patient 
to diabetic education and medic medical uh, specialist. Now coming to hypoglycemia risk, uh, each diabetic patient is vulnerable to have hypoglycemia. So that factors that can increase the uh, risk of hypoglycemia are use of insulin and uh, insulin secretogox, patient with uh, kidney and uh, um, hepatic dysfunction, longer duration of diabetes, frailty, cognitive impairment, impaired counter-regulatory uh, hormonal response, physical or intellectual disability, alcohol use, and polypharmacy. And of course, uh, uh, previous history of severe hypoglycemia. Now, uh, we have to refer uh, for initial care management to uh, uh, ophthalmologist for an annual dilated eye exam, family planning for women of reproductive age, registered dietitian for medical nut nutritional therapy, diabetic self management and education and support, dentist for comprehensive dental and periodontal examination, mental health if required, and audiology and help of social workers, community resources if indicated. So I, I spoke about the initial um, visit uh, and uh, what are the tests to be done. And this annual, during the annual visit, all these tests are repeated. But when we see the patient every three monthly or six monthly, not all tests to be all, uh, it's required. Few things is weight and height and the diet. It is very important. We have to uh, take blood pressure of that patient. We have to see for skin lesions in the uh, body. And we have to definitely uh, see for um, uh, peripheral pulsation and uh, foot examination is an integral part. And apart from that, we have to uh, measure the fasting blood glucose, postprandial and HbA1c. These are the one, uh, this is called opportunistic um, visits or uh, the follow-up visit. Uh, uh, any any of the two terms that we can use. Now, immunization uh, 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 forms a very important aspect uh, when, we, when we talk about uh, the assessment. Uh, the COVID uh, has taught us many things. Um, it is always better to vaccinate, especially the adolescent, even children, uh, with few vaccination, which has been given in the guidelines. Um, this can reduce the mortality as well as hospitalization. So few... Uh, Things are uh, hepatitis B vaccine is important, human papilloma virus vaccine, is, influenza vaccine is important. And then comes our early um, pneumococcal vaccine is important. In some places, they, uh, they go for zo herpes zoster vaccination and DPT vaccination is also recommended. Uh, this is uh, two doses of Shingrix. I think uh, in the comorbidity section, this would be taken care of. And coming uh, to autoimmune disease, uh, one patient with type 1 uh, should be screened for autoimmune thyroid uh, disease. And adults patient, if they have gastrointestinal symptoms, we have to look for celiac diseases, a cognitive impairment and dementia to be evaluated when we do the assessment because it is known thing that diabetic patient has got vascular dementia. They have more prone for Alzheimer's disease. And again, for liver disease, as um, part of screening and process of evaluation it to be taken care of. And the comorbidities, again, uh, this is going to be discussed a bit later, periodontal diseases, obstructive dis sleep dyspnea. So this is the last uh, slide of my talk. So as I said, it is um, uh, many things to be assessed when we uh, are evaluated when we treat a diabetic patient. Goals of care is preventing of complication and or delay the complication or prevent the complication, optimize quality of life. There should be a good understanding between the doctor and the patient. A doctor is the care provider and patient has to listen to him. It is not mandatory that he will listen to you, but we have to talk in a good way and make him understand that this is a chronic illness that will be there throughout his life. And to prevent complication, he has to follow a few things and um, everything to be charted out with his permission because the you know, patient is very important. What are the things we need to tell him and his, uh, uh, his contribution and his participation is also necessary. So this is uh, uh, patient-centered glycemic management in type 2 uh, diabetic patient, assessment of key patient characteristic, consider specific factors that impact choice of treatment, 
shared decision making to create a managed plan. This is very important. Not that we say you have to take this and this, if, if she has any objection to that. In India, we can do, but in foreign countries, we have to go. Actually, the patient is the most important. Whatever he says, we have to listen to him as well. Agree on management plan, which is called SMART goals, which is specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time limited. We have to implement the management plan and we have to have ongoing monitoring and support including, and we have to review and agree on management plan. And that was my slide. Thank you very much uh, for a patient hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, madam. And uh, uh, that was an excellent uh, lecture. Uh, even though it's a very big topic, you have uh, managed to cover everything in time. So uh, I request the attendees to, uh, any, if there are any questions, you can uh, uh, mention it in the chat box or we can take it up at the end of the, uh, so that we can take it up at the end of the uh, panel discussion. Next, we will move straight into the panel discussion. For that, uh, we have three experts lined up. So uh, the first is uh, Dr. Rajit Kumar, uh, who is again a well-known uh, figure in the field of uh, diabetes and uh, diabetic food management. Uh, in this part of the world. Uh, Dr. Ajit is currently working as the Chief Consultant of uh, Department of Hyperbaric Medicine and uh, General Medicine and Diabetic Foot Care at SP Fort Hospital at Trivandrum. He uh, is one of the very few experts uh, in the state and probably in the country who are uh, dealing with hyperbaric uh, therapy in the management of, who has been successfully dealing with patients with diabetic foot in the management of, uh, with uh, the uh, use of uh, hyper. Who is uh, the senior consultant uh, physician at Baby Memorial Hospital, uh, Calicut. Dibu has got uh, uh, vast amounts of experience in managing patients with uh, diabetes. He is also a faculty for uh, uh, internal medicine uh, 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 students in, in Baby Memorial Hospital. And uh, the third uh, panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Asha. Again, uh, Dr. Asha has been working as uh, the uh, chief diabetologist at Yoditev's uh, Diabetes Center in Kochi. Uh, Dr. Asha has, uh, again, uh, good experience in managing uh, patients with different uh, uh, levels of uh, diabetes, uh, which comes to Yoditev's Diabetes Center at Kochi. So I would like to start off uh, the discussion uh, with Dr. Uh, Ajit. Ajit, sir, are you there? Yes, yes, Prashant, yes. Okay. So the, the first question to Dr. Ajit is uh, a question on uh, fractures and diabetes. We will be discussing uh, some of the less commonly uh, discussed uh, comorbidities of uh, diabetes. So uh, the question is on fractures with, uh, in patients with diabetes. Are people with diabetes more prone to fractures? And why is it important to assess fracture risk in patients with diabetes? You'll be knowing a lot because you are dealing with uh, patients with diabetic food. Thank you, Dr. Prashant. I think, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers, especially Suresh sir and the speaker, Enda Madam, has given a wonderful talk. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Very much. Yes, sir. I think it's a, it's a raining here. So there may be some problem with my network. Sometimes my video may go. Please kindly excuse me because it's a heavy rain here. Okay. So the question it is actually, it is a very tricky question because we all know that uh, the diabetes has got a association with the metabolic diseases and uh, especially the, whether it is a type 1 diabetes or whether it is a type 2 diabetes, the literature review says that there will be a higher risk of uh, fracture associated with a, even if it is a for a given bond density, there is a higher chance of fracture for either a type 1 or a type 2 diabetes because the basically the structural difference of the, of the in type 1 and type 2 diabetes patients, it says that the type 1 diabetes especially has got a low bone mineral density. But even that factors because the low bone mineral density in type 1 patients, there will be a 6 to 7 fold increase of fracture risk. But it considered that the type 2 diabetes has got a high bone mineral density, but again, they have a higher risk of fractures. And even if a fracture which occurs in a diabetic patient, there is a three, three to four fold increase in the risk for a, either a delayed union or non-union, maybe because of the reduction in the inflammatory process or the healing process that we all know that there will be a defective bone healing in the type 2 diabetes. So basically, we most of the time in our clinical practice, 
we assess the quality of the bone by the uh, bone mineral density but in diabetes patients whether it is type 1 or a type 2 patients it says that the theoretical point says that there is no point in assessing the uh, characteristics of bone uh, alone by the bone mineral density because basically there is a three key factors which is there in the uh, uh, pathology of uh, uh, fractures in diabetes patients especially what we call is one is a poor bone micro texture that is the most important thing and second is the the turnover of the bone cells will be low and there will be a increased risk of fall because we all aware that the comorbidity is like either a neuropathy or a retinopathy or a autonomic uh, dysfunction these things has got a higher risk of chance of fall in the individual so those who are aged patients especially above 65 years of age it says that the higher risk of neuropathy or the associated nephropathy or the recurrent fall which has got a higher association with the bone bone fractures and the hyperglycemia which says that the, the, it increases the risk factor because the advanced glycation in products which will affect the 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 basic structure of bones especially like the uh, what do you call the collagen or the osteocytes all these things normal actions will be get affected by the uh, what do you call the uh, hyperglycemia especially the advanced glycation in products so the osteoclast induced the bone resorption will be promoted and there will be more chance for the usually what happens is there will be the, the, the quality of the healthy bone is basically by the collagen fiber network so it overcomes the strain which is happening in the joints or the bones so due to the advanced glycation product it affects the collagen structure of the molecule as i said earlier the key factors the bone micro texture the long uh, bone turnover and increased risk of fall causes the high chance of risk in the diabetes and the pathology is different for the type 1 and type 2 for an increased risk of fracture i am not going into the details but in type 1 basically it is the osteopenia the associated dyslipidemia the inflammatory process per se promotes the fracture risk and those who has got an associated retinopathy and neuropathy has got a higher risk of fall and we have to be very careful whenever we interact with an old patient we have to give more importance for the hypoglycemia when we go for a treatment of diabetes we should not go for a more stringent control of diabetes and we should not induce frequent hypoglycemia that will increase the chance of fractures so it says that those more than 65 years there will be if they are taking associated drugs like opiates and other things there will be my uh, more chance i'll take 30 seconds more i know it is 2 or 3 minutes But, but in the literature it says that the renal insufficiency associated lead to secondary and the third hyperparathyroid tertiary hyperparathyroidism also can lead to increased past risk but we may have a doubt that which is the best test to assess the fracture risk it says that be uh, the bone uh, the uh, the dexas can be usually used for osteoporosis is not useful in diabetes patients they says that if we can adopt any uh, methodology which can look for the bone micro architecture or the bone quality will be useful but it is very rarely available so we have to think about few things we have to be very careful about the recurrent fall patients and we have to rule out the concurrent osteoporosis and vitamin deficiency it says that if we give, minimum you keep the vitamin d more than 30 microgram and the calcium supplement should be 1 gram per day in a high risk individuals and few drugs have to be careful don't use pioglitazones and especially the bariatric surgery these two groups are has got a uh, what you call more chance of may, may changing the architecture of the bone and there will be higher chance of fractures thank you uh, for that and so again a very uh, <clears throat> an area which is less often looked in patients with diabetes uh, quickly moving on to dr debu again i know that this is a very big task for you a big question for you uh non alcoholic fatty liver disease and diabetes it's it's a topic for a half day session so i'd like to uh, get your answer in 3 uh, minutes that is uh, uh, nafld and diabetes uh, you know that uh, we know that it has a bidirectional uh, relationship so what does the current evidence say on screening for nafld in patients with diabetes and vice versa okay it's a big task uh, to cover nafld in 3 minutes so as you all know the nfld as per the american association of study of liver disease in 2018 practice guidelines it says that the diagnosis of nfld that means um, the non alcoholic fatty liver disease means uh, the <clears throat> evidence of hepatic steatosis either by imaging 
or by histology. And there should be lack of uh, secondary causes of hep hepatic fat accumulations like uh, significant alcohol consumption, long-term use of uh, stero uh, steatogenic drugs or monogenic hereditary disorders and not. So we can classify this NAFLD into two uh, types, that's NAFL and NASH. That is NAFL means non-alcoholic fatty liver disease with hepatic cetosis more than 5% in the liver without any inflammation. But uh, if there is an inflammation like uh, ballooning, we can classify it as uh, NASH. So this uh, NAFLD, the prevalence is uh, on, uh, when you are considering the prevalence around 25% um, uh, globally and more prevalent in Middle East and second uh, and least in the Africa and all. And this NAFLD is associated with the metabolic syndrome uh, components. And these metabolic uh, syndrome components also increases the incidence of NAFLD. There is a bidirection relationship like that. Especially the obesity is more common with NAFLD. And this uh, diabetes, and in uh, diabetes and NAFLD can occur simultaneously in an individual. So it can confound the uh, prevalence that is diabetes, NAFLD in diabetes and diabetes in NAFLD. It can confound the prevalence of this NAFLD. And uh, based on the uh, uh, screening, uh, screening uh, criteria, it's uh, ADA and uh, in this American gastroenterologist and AST all it's sat together and um, uh, uh, declared one uh, that there is a NASH epidemic is coming on, so we have to be careful and all. And, but all patients uh, having this um, diabetes should not be screened for uh, NAFLD. This ADA recommends that uh, the patients with type 2 diabetes or pre-diabetes and elevated liver enzymes for a fatty liver that is seen in ultrasound should be uh, evaluated for the presence of non-alcoholic steatoid hepatitis because this diabetes is um, uh, uh, responsible or until cause more uh, severe manifestations of NAFLD like NASH, cirrhosis, and sometimes epithelial carcinoma. So we have to be careful, and but we are we should not screen everybody, but we have to screen selectively. And you can incidentally sometimes, most probably this most commonly this NAFLD is an incidental diagnosis when you are taking uh, USC for some other reason you will find a bad liver. And, but in uh, diabetic patients who are having uh, raised um, LFT and, and enzyme, liver enzymes, and uh, they are uh, accidentally we are getting this uh, fatty liver disease in USC, we have to uh, screen for other uh, in the progressive this NASH or whether it is going for a cirrhosis and all. So uh, when you are, you can use non-invasive tests like uh, this uh, NFS and, and, and the FIB scores. And when uh, considering the treatment aspect, uh, all when you are treating this um, uh, metabolic uh, syndrome components and the newer drugs like GLP-1 RAs, SGLD2 inhibitors, and the older stalwarts like metformin and paglitazone are included in the treatment of the NAFLD. So the, the relation of NAFLD in diabetes is so strong, and we have to be careful. And but we should not screen unw unwantedly, but we should screen for those patients who are having. Um, elevated liver enzymes mm -hmm. and were found to be uh, in, uh, in, uh, found to have fatty liver during uh, USC screening and all. And such patients we have to monitor. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dibu, for that very crisp answer uh, on uh, NAFLD and uh, diabetes. So next, I would like to uh, ask Dr. Asha on uh, another very common associ thing associated with diabetes. That is uh, cancer and diabetes. We are al almost always in our lectures, our meetings with diabetes, we have a lecture on diabetes and cancer. So does uh, diabetes have a strong relation with, uh, relationship with cancer or uh, do we need to screen all patients uh, with diabetes? Uh, what is the, the current situation on that? Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Team RSSTA for making me a part of this esteemed panel. And I feel honored for that. Now, without wasting time, uh, straight into the topic. So diabetes and cancer, they do share a common platform uh, in many aspects. And uh, we know that certain cancers are more common in diabetes. For example, uh, cancer of pancreas, cancer of liver, cancer of endometrium. These are two times more common in diabetes than in general population. Whereas in cancer of breast, cancer of colon rectum, cancer of bladder. These are around 1.2 to 1.5 times more common in patients with diabetes than in general population. This 
would be multiple factors might be responsible because there are a lot of uh, common risk factors which are there for both diabetes and cancer. For example, age. As age advances, cancer risk is higher, diabetes risk is higher. Obesity and diet both increase the risk of both cancer as well as diabetes. Then there are other modifiable risk factors like alcohol, smoking, a lot of things are there which are common to both diabetes and cancer. So this might be a factor which increases the chances. Then there are factors related to can diabetes physiology that might make patients with diabetes more susceptible for cancer. For example, hyperinsulinemia, insulin-like growth factor receptors are seen in a lot of cancer cells. So hyperinsulinemia might be a factor which can promote mitosis and may promote cancer. Then hyperglycemia may be a factor. Inflammatory state that is there in diabetics might be a fast factor. All these might be contributed. And another factor is that prognosis is poorer in patients with diabetes when they develop cancer. And diabetes control can become more difficult when they are having cancer and they are undergoing treatment. So a lot of things are there. But uh, people or patients, they would like to know more about cancer diabetes treatment and cancer. They always keep asking, does any drug produce cancer? Should we take care of, uh, means any drug, insulin, can they increase cancer? There are, means, there are certain drugs like metformin, which are found to be protective against cancer, but there are observations or certain controversies regarding some other drugs. For example, bioglipazone and bladder cancer liraglutide and medullary carcinoma of thyroid. These are few observations that have been there in the studies, and but none of these are big enough to prevent usage of these drugs. Only recommendation is that there should be caution or in selected population, like a patient with a history or a family history of medullary carcinoma thyroid, avoid liraglutide. In a patient with any symptoms suggestive of bladder cancer, Avoid bioglutazone. So there is nothing which says that these drugs should not be used or they cause cancer, but exercise caution in some selected population. Insulin, uh, insulin, in case of insulin, there was a controversy regarding insulin glargine, where high affinity of for IGF-1 receptor was found, and it was feared that it might increase cancer. But a very large trial, like origin trial for Glargine did not find any increased risk of cancer in patients using Glargine. So Glargine is still the world's most widely used insulin. And there is no evidence to say that use of Glargine may increase cancer. So that is the drugs and cancer. So coming to the recommendations, whether we should screen all patients with diabetes for cancer, what ADA says is that all age-appropriate cancer screening that are recommended for general population, it should be emphasized or stressed on patients with cancer, with diabetes. So whenever they come to us for treatment, we have to emphasize the age-appropriate screening, like mammograms and like uh, stool local blood testing or sigmoidoscopies endometrial testing in females, pap smears, all these are age-appropriate testing recommended for all patients. So these should be stressed upon and emphasized on patients with diabetes because they are at an increased risk compared to general population. Other than that, it's not mandatory that we should screen every diabetes patient for all sorts of cancers. Thank, Thank you, you. Uh, Dr. Asha. That was a comprehensive answer uh, to the uh, question, I think. So uh, we would, uh, I will uh, quickly uh, move on to the next question to Dr. Rajit. Again, uh, another uh, less commonly asked question is uh, uh, hypo, uh, low testosterone levels in males with uh, diabetes. Uh, why would you evaluate them for low testosterone and how? Again, brief answer. Sir, you can unmute. Dr. Prashant, it is again a, a very interesting question and always a, there is a, a controversy about the uh, testosterone, when to check and uh, who are the group of people who are to be undergone the checking of testosterone in routine clinical practices. 
the our first question has got a relation with the, the this also because the testosterone as we all know the there will be a if there is a testosterone in reduction or it's part of the hypogonadotropic hypogonadism it is very commonly established in type 2 diabetes patients because and there will be an impaired bone health and there will be an increased fracture risk if there is a any problem with the uh, testosterone synthesis so we all know that insulin resistance is associated with the Uh, the reduced amount of testosterone, and it has seen that those patients who has got a reduced testosterone level, they have a high chance of getting a, uh, a type two diabetes uh, mellitus, and uh, it has got a strong association with other metabolic diseases, as we discussed about thing, and uh, uh, it says that about uh, two third of uh, men who has got a, a type two diabetes has got a low uh, testosterone uh, in their body. and what happens is basically the hyperglycemia which produces as we discuss most of the uh, complications of diabetes is basically because of the hyperglycemia and that leads to the advanced glycation products and the free radical injury so this chronic hyperglycemia which is leads to a uh, hypothalamic pituitary gonadal axis suppression and this will lead to the decreased testosterone synthesis and i had uh, searched in the literature i think uh, there is a, no agency which is recommends a A regular testing of uh, testosterone, but in diabetes, especially in type two diabetes, the relation with the testosterone is those when in your clinical practice, those who are coming to you with an erectile dysfunction, especially if they have a loss of libido or if they has got uh, some symptoms which is more in favor of an osteoporosis or bone symptoms like a pain or a history of a fracture or uh, anything is there, then in that sort of individuals you have to check for a testosterone, and the cutoff it says that. Uh, the free testosterone if anywhere it is less than uh, 12 then you have to look for the uh, you have to be uh, aware about the possibility of hypogonadotropic hypogonadism and most important thing is uh, the hypogonadism is considered as the one of the major cause for uh, what you call the osteoporosis in men so that what we have to be a very important and whenever there is a decrease in the androgen hormones in the men there will be increase the, the chance of uh, what you call the uh, fracture of the bones so uh, literature uh, whether it is ada or uh, endocrine society they did not uh, recommend a routine testing of testosterone but it says that the uh, the endocrine people and the and the, the discussion says that if there is a high uh, risk chance of any previous fracture or what you call the erectile dysfunction or a loss of libido in that group of individual you have to do and another thing is low testosterone can be associated with an increased one study has shown that there is an increased chance of body mass index there will be dyslipidemia especially the triglycerides will be more and the hdl will be less and that individuals will have a high chance of getting into a coronary event so if you come across any individuals who has got a certain um lipid character or a strong family history in that group of individuals also you can evaluate the um, uh, testosterone so the, um, especially if anybody has got an libido or a, what you call a depression or what you call the erectile dysfunction all that category of men you should look for a testosterone but uh, regular checking of testosterone is not recommended by any uh, agencies thank you sir i hope sir. i had uh, Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. Very much, very much. And uh, next question to Dr. Dibu uh, is on uh, cognitive function. Why assessment of cognitive function is important in patients with diabetes? Oh, that's a very nice question. So, as you all know, uh, diabetes is associated with significantly increased risk of cognitive decline. As per uh, an observational study, there is a meta-analysis of the, all the observational studies. Uh, the um, prevalence of uh, this all cause dementia and uh, is 73 percentage higher in diabetic patients and alzheimer's dementia is uh, 56% higher in uh, diabetic patients and um, another thing is uh, this um, vascular dementia is uh, 127% higher in uh, diabetic patients when compared to non diabetic individuals and this patients who are having alzheimer's dementia develop uh, more diabetes than patients who doesn't have diabetes the vice versa and many factors that cause this um, uh, cognitive decline this uh, degree of degree and severity of the hyperglycemia and the duration of the hyperglycemia if it is increases 
uh, the, there is an increased chance of liver dementia. Because as per the accord study, if you have a one percent increase in HB A1C, there is an increased chance of cognitive decline. And uh, the, when considering the treatment aspect, if you treat intensively or conservatively, yeah, as per the accord accord uh, study, you can get uh, this micro cognitive decline. So there is no difference in the treatment uh, whether it is intensive or they don't recommend intensive. And another thing is hypoglycemia, which is associated more with this uh, this um, cognitive decline. Even single hypoglycemia episodes can step by uh, step by step may de uh, decrease the cognitive uh, function of the patient. And then sometimes um, they uh, thought previously thought that uh, this um, diet and nutrition is associated with the uh, cognitive decline, but and the recommended Mediterranean diet and all. But recent Cochrane reviews says that there is no association uh, like that. And previously there was a controversy with statin. It's associated with, the, but uh, the USFDA also um, says that uh, the um, database, uh, USFDA database says that there is no much uh, reports of uh, statin causing this dementia. Then about uh, this dementia and all more more common in older adults. And because of uh, all these uh, problems, this uh, we have to consider a assessment of uh, medical, psychological, and functional and social aspects of the older individuals so that comprehensively we have to consider and formulate a uh, uh, treatment target. Then uh, we have to screen for all geriatric syndromes in these uh, patients with uh, older individuals with diabetes, like uh, polypharmacy, cognitive impairment, uh, depression, urinary incontinence, etc. And screening and early detection of this mild uh, cognitive impairment um, or dementia is very important. And can be performed in all patients with uh, 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 diabetes. And another important thing is the most important thing is the safety of the patients. If the patient is having more uh, cognitive decline, as per accord, there is a more severe hypoglycemic episode. And the vice versa, if the patient is having more severe hypoglycemic episode, there is a more chance of cognitive decline also. So, uh, in the presence of uh, cognitive uh, impairment, the diabetic treatment regimens should be simplified as much as possible to prevent the uh, risk of hypoglycemia. This is the current um, um, recommendation by this uh, ADA. So this cognitive decline and this uh, diabetes is interrelated and we, the, we have to ensure the safety of the patient by minimizing the uh, number of drugs and we have to make the uh, therapy more simpler. Thank you, Dr. Devo. That's a very, very valid uh, point uh, you were discussing. Uh, quickly on to the next uh, question to Dr. Asha on uh, the importance of uh, evaluation for uh, obstructive sleep apnea. Again, I know that it's a very uh, long uh, thing to discuss. Uh, try to keep it short. Yes, uh, obstructive sleep apnea one is one of the least recognized, least suspected, least tested, and least treated comorbidity. But it's not very uncommon. In obesity, it is 10 times higher, obstructive sleep apnea. And in diabetes, actually, the prevalence may be as high as 23%. And the total sleep disorder treating may be as high as 58%. So it's not something that is very rare. So it's always important to suspect and look for or ask for symptoms of obstructive sleep apnea. Why it is important? Because it is an independent cardiovascular risk factor. A patient with a severe obstructive sleep apnea has got 2.5 times higher risk of developing MI, undergoing revascularization, stroke, etc. So even if we take care of everything and don't look into this, we are giving some residual risk for the patient, which could have been prevented. So who are the patients who should be screened? Everyone need not be screened. Asymptomatic screening in asymptomatic patients have not been found to be useful, but in patients who are having symptoms. So what are the symptoms? The common symptoms are increased daytime somnolence, unrefreshing sleep, tiredness, uh, snoring, the partner witnessing the apnea episodes. These are the common symptoms, but it can, they can have a typical symptoms also like uh, lack of concentration, memory loss, irritability, morning headache, uh, erectile dysfunction, all can occur as atypical symptoms. So whenever there are risk factors and patient is obese, high central obesity, neck circumference high, they should be evaluated. 
and how do we evaluate gold standard is polysomnography but there are simpler home sleep apnea testing methods also where less number of channels are tested and based on the uh, apnea hyperpnea index diagnosis is made and severity is classified and once diagnosis is made there are treatment options based on the cause also cpap can be used lifestyle changes weight loss always help then if there are specific problems identified like tonsils or large tongue or problems with the palate there are surgical options also laser surgeries like uvulopalatopharyngeoplasties which can actually solve the problem so it's a treatable problem when identified so it's always important to suspect and look for that too not just hypertension and cholesterol and other things this is also something that is common especially with this obesity epidemic which is already there thank you thank you uh, dr asha we will we have a couple of questions left uh, i will quickly pass on to the the final two, uh, two or three questions uh, dr rajit one quick reply on uh, the uh, hearing loss and diabetes again very less commonly discussed topic one minute reply yes uh, one word i'll say this is the least recognized complication out of all the uh, diabetes issues it says that about more than 40 percentage of individuals will have a hearing loss i think irrespective of the blood sugar status it says that you have to check it is basically based on the duration of the diabetes and the age of the individual the hearing loss depends and it says majority of the studies are done by the pyotron audiogram and they had made the cut off of more than 25 decibel of loss and these studies have shown that the hearing loss was more for the 6000 to 8000 uh, uh, hertz and you have to be very careful it was more commonly seen those patients who had an hypertension especially those who are taken diuretics and those who had got an dyslipidemia and hypothyroidism and you have to be very careful in a majority of the diabetic patients will have an underlying renal dysfunction so if you give a antibiotics for the what you call the infections you i mean like cause like autotoxic drugs if you give in that group of individuals they will have a high uh, chance of getting hearing loss and one study has said that aspirin uh, the 75 mg routine for primary uh, prevention dose is increasing the chance of uh, uh, hearing loss the reason did not uh, mention but one the saudi study says that there, there is no significant difference with the aspirin group but ada doesn't recommend the routine screening of hearing loss in uh, diabetes patients i Thank think uh, one minute is over Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rajit, for that uh, quick reply. Next, again, uh, uh, the last question to Dr. Deepu is on uh, pancreatitis. Pancreatitis and uh, diabetes, uh, how is it related? Again, one minute. Uh, pancreatitis and diabetes. Pancreatitis uh, will disrupt the whole architecture of this um, uh, pancreas, and we will have both insulin deficiency and glucagon deficiency. So, Uh, this uh, um, pancreatitis exocrine uh, deficiency of pancreas uh, is associated with this diabetic patients so many of the patients uh, having diabetes have some exocrine uh, problems of the pancreatitis pancreas and also this uh, pancreatitis uh, causes pancreatic diabetes because of many reasons and even uh, small uh, one bout of the pancreatitis can lead to pancreatic diabetes but recurrent bouts are more risky and the diabetes because of the exocrine deficiency of uh, pancreas is uh, termed as pancreatic previc diabetes and it is now classified as uh, type 3c diabetes that is pancreatic diabetes and also there are in diabetic patients there is a two fold increase chance of getting pancreatitis so in both uh, ways they are related and the importance of um, pancreatic diabetes is that when the patient uh, develops hypoglycemia we should be more careful because the com- compensatory mechanism of this correction of hypoglycemia that is glucagon is also lost in this pancreatic diabetes so we have to be careful i think you, i think i made your job uh, much difficult by uh, trying to uh, <laughs> question in one minute thank you again dr devu final question to dr asha is on uh, periodontitis uh, again uh, a very common combination with diabetes again from the physician side we often tend to miss periodontitis so what does the guidelines say uh, can i unmute yourself periodontitis and uh, diabetes they have got a bidirectional relationship it is uh, periodontitis is more common in patients with diabetes more severe and the higher hpa1c increases the risk 
Similarly, vice versa. If you screen all patients with periodontitis for diabetes, you will get an increased prevalence of diabetes amenta. And it's also a chronic inflammatory state. It has been found that presence of periodontitis also increases uh, the microvascular as well as microvascular complications in patients with diabetes. And similarly, the treatment of periodontitis actually is found to reduce the HbA1c by around 0.5 to 0.7. So it's like adding a, a SGLT2 inhibitor to your metformin. So that much benefit it can get if you treat, identify and treat periodontitis. What the guidelines say is that a detailed dental examination should be a part of initial evaluation. They should be sent to dentist and detailed evaluation should be done and treatment should be taken. And thereafter, annual visit to the dentist always helps to keep periodontitis under check and that can help our diabetes management and improve hva ones Thank you, uh, Dr. Asha, for that uh, uh, crisp answer. And I think that uh, brings us to the end of uh, today's uh, uh, discussion. I thank all the panelists for uh, sticking to the time and uh, cooperating to finish the meeting almost on time as we had uh, planned. And all the answers have been crisp and comprehensive. I couldn't uh, ask for a better uh, discussion than this. Thank you uh, once again for the uh, good panel discussion. There is one question which is there in the chat box. Uh, Anita, Madam, uh, I'd like to ask uh, that question to you. The question is by Dr. Robin. Uh, if HbA1c of a patient is seven, but his FBS and PPBS are not controlled, uh, should we need to rearrange the medications in view of the uh, FBS and PPBS, or uh, do we have to continue the current medication in view of control HbA1c? So this is something very common, the fallacies of yeah. uh, the HbA1c and the, the uh, blood glucose values. Yeah, uh, so that's a very good question. And the thing is, uh, um, yeah, we see many patients with a normal HbA1c, but their fasting or postprandial may be very high. So if the patient is um, uh, has been seeing you for quite some time, and uh, you know that she is uh, very uh, meticulous in all the things, you can give a benefit of doubt, one thing. Second thing is um, um, you have to ask for the diet that she has taken on that day, because HbA1c will just show the glucose control of the last three months, uh, first month, second month, and third month, more from the second and third month of last three months. And uh, um, you can ask for, a uh, the, if they have a glucometer, if they are uh, routinely measuring their uh, blood sugar level, you can go ask them to do a fasting and post prandial after two, three days, and then come back to you. If it is more, then you have to adjust it because uh, sometimes we know we have got so many uh, things to be taken into consideration when we interpret uh, 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 HbA1c. There are conditions when it is more, where there are conditions where it, it is less. So um, if the th th things are obvious, just, just like if the patient has loss of blood, heavy loss of blood, anemia, and uh, pregnancy, there are so many factors that will increase the HbA1c hemoglobinopathies. So, so many things are there. Just evaluate and then adjust the dose of medicine. That, that's what we usually do. You cannot keep on repeating hemoglobin HbA1c the next day or third day because it's a costly thing. So just uh, think uh, and act judiciously. That will help. And okay. you can, of course, change, the, as you said, the, the adjustment of uh, uh, dose can be done or the shifting of the dose can be done. You can adjust it. That's what I feel. Another I common practice is actually, Prashant, I'll tell you, another common practice to the patients is that they usually what they do is when they go to the doctor, they skip the medicine for uh, one day or two and see two whether the sugar is increasing or not. All these while they were taking, meticulously taking the medicines and the HB1 is well controlled. On, on the day or probably for two days, they will skip medicine. And then the hb one c will be apparently uh, normal and the blood sugar will be high. So that is uh, the most yes. important and most common cause for this sort of presentation. And I think uh, uh, we should always uh, recheck the lab where the HP1C has been done. Uh, we have a lab here in Patanata where uh, whoever goes there, the HP1C will be 6.4. <laughs> That's also there. Uh, anemia, anemia also you have to roll out. 
most of the time you will to show us a low amc value acute blood loss is not chronic blood loss acute blood loss actually iron deficiency and even also actually increases the hba increases the hba yeah, yeah. 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 acute, acute blood loss is there yeah it will decrease and iron yeah. iron deficiency anemia will increase Uh, HBA, any any anemia having like no high uh, like no uh, uh, hemoglobin turnover. Hemo- yeah, hemoglobinopathies, be- all these things yeah, to be yeah. taken. Uremia, yeah. all these things to be taken into consideration. Have an option for CGM; it will help. Yeah, yeah. 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 of course. course. After, yeah. After you have an option for CGM. Everything is negative. We can go for CGM. Yeah, because yeah. he may be having hypoglycemia, which may be missed, and which might be averaging the HBA ones. Yeah, what point Doctor Sudesh said is relevant because many patients they will come, they will not take medicine for two three days, and then they come to us. That's a very yeah. valid point that he has pointed out, right? Thank Or you. Or else they'll try eating uh, everything what they get just before going to the doctor to see how much my blood sugar goes up and skip the medicine. That's also there. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. many things. Yeah. and another thing is that to see actually whether we have missed something like hypertriglyceridemia or something like that might interfere with the. A sort of uh, A1C, and, uh, which we are not really taking care of, or we are skip, uh, skip. So an- another thing is, uh, <laughs> I used to see a lot of patients with the normal A1C with the sudden increase in fasting blood sugar. We just look at the food; there may be a beautiful ulcer which will be in the intertor region. Probably that diabetic foot infection that will be triggering. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Ah, yeah. Yeah. So That's normal very- A1C. If you get a fasting or PPBS, please look at between the toes. You will get a beautiful ulcer there, and they will end up in yeah. a ketosis. Yeah, infections can be considered. Yeah, any yeah. especially UTI and diabetes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 exactly. Yeah. Urinary tract yeah. infection and all. So recently, I had a patient who yeah. had actually under beautiful HbA1c profile all this while. Suddenly, she came with a sort of high blood sugar for. And uh, when I uh, like you know uh, 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 elicited the history, I found that she had uh, a sort of uh, cold and. Uh, Fever for the past two days. That's why our sugar has gone up. But our HP ones was uh, normal. As Dibu was telling, any infection for that matter, uh, you have to elicit that history as well, or look for uh, hidden infections. As Ajit was telling, like uh, uh, sort of ulcers or even periodontal inflammation or tooth uh, ache or probably dental abscesses, tooth infection. All these things can increase uh, the blood sugar suddenly in the background of a sort of very controlled HP uh, ones. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for that uh, uh, good discussion i like the term beautiful also from uh, dr rajiv <laughs> that's it. for them it is a very beautiful thing <laughs> for any surgeon <laughs> for surgeon swellings are beautiful things ulcers are beautiful things for them that is what they get to handle <laughs> <laughs>